We are dedicated to bringing light to some of Kentuckyana's darkest unsolved cases. I'm Shay McAllister, revisiting cases that have gone cold and others that are getting new leads, which could help detectives finally find closure. We start with one of the most well-known cases right here in Louisville. You've probably seen the missing posters all around Jefferson County. Andrea Knable has been missing for years. Our team has been following her since the beginning, piecing together Knable's path on that final night. The 37-year-old was last seen walking from her sister's house to her mom's house. That's where she was staying in the Audubon Park neighborhood here in Louisville. Well, that was August 12th of 2019. Mike Knable says his daughter was going through a tough time when she disappeared, losing her job and then her home. He's worried she might have gotten into something bad with people she considered to be her friends. It's a gentleman. It's been seven plus weeks since my family was assured that this case, that the case of my missing daughter, Andrea Knable, was described as open and active. Mike Knable sent this email to LMPD on the morning of our interview. Sadly, none of the plan described has even begun as far as we can tell. Yet another attempt, he says, to contact the agency tasked with uncovering what happened to his missing daughter. I, I told him that we're discovering things that they may not know that could really help them and I would at least like some communication to talk to them about it. I, I think they've got their own plan and their own system and uh, uh, maybe a distraught father of a, a daughter that's been gone 19 months isn't part of that. Knable has been hands-on every step of this search since the first night his 37-year-old daughter Andrea went missing in August of 2019. Um, we are beaten up, yes, but we're, we're, we don't feel like we're beaten and um, we, we um, feel like we're strong enough to, to see this to the end. We hope we are. He says the family finds strength in new developments in her case. The most recent came after a new set of eyes started asking questions. My name is Joe Fanciulli. I'm a retired homicide detective. The detective found a Facebook group for missing people. That led him to Andrea. I met Andrea's family and uh, volunteered uh, to help to basically go in and look at this as a cold case, go back to the beginning, uh, redo everything. In the days after Andrea first disappeared, investigators used her computer to create a Google timeline, tracking her final movements before her cell phone went dark. That's where the detective started. When I looked at them, they weren't quite complete. Following Andrea's trail, he discovered a discrepancy, finding she wasn't at her mom's house until 6.30 a.m., like originally thought. We don't know where Andrea was from 353 on. He says the difference of three hours is huge, and already more people are speaking out with new information. So we're, we're turning over a lot of rocks and we're poking a lot of hornet's nests, and it's, it's starting to bring out more information now than I think the family has had in the last year and a half, and that's a good thing. But is it enough? Andrea's family worried without collaboration from LMPD, the new leads may end up going cold. We, we don't feel let down. We are let down. Um, but I'm not sure who to, to blame exactly. Despite his disappointment with local law enforcement's efforts, he ends his latest attempt for answers with gratitude. My family enthusiastically support your efforts and thanks you for what you've done for the community. Um, signed, Mike Knable and family. Now to a case that's had a major break. Three decades after a suspected murder for hire, detectives in Gallatin County, Kentucky, think they have found the people responsible for killing Bernard Hopkins, the man known as Cowboy. Norma Bladen shared a home with her brother Cowboy the night he was shot and killed in 1989. 30 years later, we met her on that property. 30 years later, she still had hope. Faith, family, friends, and Detective Samuel, I think we'll get there. And now, new answers in her brother's murder. On Friday, a Gallatin County grand jury heard the case, indicting Sean Satchwell for murder, Curtis Sharon for complicity to murder and solicitation for murder, and Ricky Asher for tampering with physical evidence and criminal facilitation to murder. All three were arrested over the weekend. Satchwell and Asher taken into custody in Kentucky. Sharon was found in Indiana. Police wouldn't tell us exactly what happened, but these photos from the scene show evidence detectives used in the investigation, including a footprint left behind after the late night shooting and the gunshot trajectory. The shooter firing one shot through the front window of the home. 
hitting Cowboy between the eyes. He was sleeping on the couch. The Commonwealth's attorney says multiple agencies were involved in this investigation, including the United States Secret Service. And tonight, in a statement released to WHAS 11, the Commonwealth's attorney, Lewis Kelly, said, quote, My office will fervently prosecute these cases and do everything we can to ensure the demands of justice are met. Could the answers to a decade-old mystery be hidden in the hills of eastern Kentucky? Detectives and family related to Richard Strong seem to think so. He was last seen alive at a campsite on top of a mountain right near Hazard. That was 10 years ago, and despite searches, interrogations, and evidence collected, no clue has ever led to the missing man. Through the hollows of eastern Kentucky, the hills and valleys can be hard to navigate. It's just a huge, huge area. So when Richard Strong disappeared... That was an awful night. Everything and everywhere was considered evidence. At one point in time, six of us was probably working from daylight to dark. Around the clock efforts at first eventually turned into files put into folders. More than a decade later, Richard's wife says she believes answers are still ahead. What comes around goes around. That's the saying everybody says around here, and I believe in it. And this picture was here was happy times. We would have been married 16 years. Darlene Strong still smiles at the memories. And ain't a day go by, I don't think about him. The better days before her husband left to go meet people at a campsite and never made it home. There's an empty spot in your heart. It'll never close. It never will. Her pain pushes police for answers. Well, Darlene, she still, she has no idea what's happened to Richard. More than a decade later, detectives focus on finding him. I'm Chris Collins. I'm a detective with the Kentucky State Police. I'm the officer uh, in charge of investigating the missing person case of Richard Strong. It was February of 2011. Strong was with a friend and some acquaintances at an old strip job. Darlene was at home when she says someone came to her front door panicked, explaining her husband was hurt. First, the trooper on the case started searching for Strong's car. It wasn't strong inside, but someone else. And when the car got stuck on a back road in eastern Kentucky, the man inside got out and ran. Troopers searched for him, now considered a suspect, while the local rescue squad was called in to search for strong. Once the search started, it was all hands on deck. So investigators turned their attention elsewhere, looking for the people who were with him that night. It was believed from interviewing all of them that when Richard was at the campsite, he was accused of possibly stealing a wallet off of one of the individuals. Um, and he was actually struck by an individual there two times, put, and he left walking from the campsite. Last seen walking away. That's the story police were provided. But this investigator says he thinks something else happened. I believe that he he is deceased. I believe that they that something was done to him. Um, that's just uh, and that there is a few people out there that that knows the story. And then I believe I've talked to them, but I've just not got it from them. For the victim's wife, the real story matters. Now I'm hoping that I get to see justice. Because Richard didn't deserve this. He was too good to people. But with the time that has passed, the detective admits justice will be difficult. So his priority for closure in this case, find the missing man. Well, anytime we work cases like this, our main goal is if somebody's involved, you know, we want to make sure justice is served. But my, that's not my goal in this, it was just to find his remains. He was an experienced first responder, leader of the Kentucky State Police Water Rescue Unit, 
but on an April evening in 1972, something went wrong. Trooper James McNeely was called in to respond and rescue two missing boys on the Kentucky River, but it turned into a rescue gone wrong. When duty calls. You know, praying that they're alive, hoping that, you know, that they'll turn up safe. A first responder always answers. He was contacted at home about two boys who had been missing for several hours on the Kentucky River here at Frankfort. No matter the place. Water rescues are extremely dangerous no matter the time. He left his house around five o'clock to go search for these boys. It's the Kentucky State Police Code of Ethics. Serve mankind, safeguard lives. They were just trying to do their job. But on this day, the tables were turned. The water levels were very high that day. The one sent to search, suddenly needing saving. My name is Katrina McNeely, and I am searching for answers in the disappearance of my father, Trooper James McNeely. She was only a child when her father went missing. It's um, very disappointing I never got to know him. She tries to remember his face. Big stature about him, big personality, big blue eyes, dark hair. For the rest of his story, she relies on records. Trooper McNeely wasn't on duty the night he disappeared. And it was his day off because it was a 16-year anniversary. But when he got the call that someone needed him, he dropped everything to respond. He left his house around 5 o'clock to go search for these boys, where he met with Water Patrol Officer David Childs. Officer Childs was an experienced Water Patrol Officer. Trooper McNeely led the unit for the Kentucky State Police. He had came to Frankfort to take over the boating division when it first was started. So um, he knew what was going on, you know, with the boats and everything, and knew what to be done. A third man was also in the boat, a friend of Trooper McNeely's. Police say the rescuers never made contact with the missing boys. They were eventually found safe. They got in the boat, got out on the water. As they were getting close to uh, one of the locks, another gentleman saw them getting too close to the dam, uh, started yelling for them, you know, trying to point out the dam. Uh, about that time, that gentleman noticed that the motor had stopped on the boat. The boat overturned and went over the dam and was broken apart as it went over. All three men went overboard. The water levels were, were very high that day and at a dangerous level. McNeely's friend was saved. Police say Trooper McNeely and Officer Childs drowned. When the water receded, one body surfaced. Officer Childs, his body was recovered sometime later, 126 miles away in Tell City, Indiana. And Trooper McNeely's body had, has never been recovered. Katrina remembers getting the news. I remember the next day, though, the everyone crying and the, just the trauma of it all and just so many family members trying to get to us as fast as they could. She says she also remembers having questions. I was probably like in my late 20s, early 30s. And I started, that's when I started talking to the state police about my dad and there was no information. She said police wouldn't tell her how long they searched for her dad. I would think someone who was a 16 year veteran that you would have some kind of files of one way or another. She said they couldn't tell her how it happened. Do you believe that the boat went over the dam and he drowned? I question it. I am not 100% believe that it was an accident or that he is even dead or that it was foul play. I still have my doubts about it. I, I'm not 100% about anything because there's just too many things that don't match. She has questions about the search, how long they looked and where. Questions about the boat, why the motor failed. Questions about his badge. 
She says it was never returned. Just every time I find something and have it addressed, it always gets shut down. Something she is certain of, she missed out on years of memories. Everyone told me that when you met my father that you would never forget him. Police promise they're doing everything they can to find the missing trooper. We're never going to give up trying to look for Trooper McNeely. Katrina's promise? She won't stop asking questions about his case. I've been going through this my whole life. I need answers. Wouldn't you want answers? Claude and Sue Shelton were last seen on a May night in 1971. They put their three young children to bed and then left the house. No family, no friends, nobody indicated that they would ever have even think about leaving their kids like that. And they haven't been seen since. It happened in the 70s when some say it was easier to disappear. But those who know them best say they never would have abandoned their children. It's the place where history has a home. A treasure trove of truths and diary of disasters. The most memorable moments put down on paper. At the Times Tribune in Corbin, Kentucky. Noteworthy news lives on every page, but in the corner there's one story seemingly lost between the lines. May 28, 1971, uh, Post 11 was contacted about missing persons, Claude and Sue Shelton. Missing persons, parents. They told their children they were going to Jerry's truck stop, which was just five miles down the road. Everything pointed to them returning shortly afterwards, and they were never seen again. That sounds suspicious, yeah. It's like somebody did something with them there. The kids did say that there was a jar with, with some money in it, and obviously when the investigator got there and learned this um, for the sake of you know knowledge about the money, he had them check and it was gone. The search for answers starts in the same place the parents' story ends. Corbin, Kentucky, where one woman is known for her knowledge of the town. I'm Ann Hoskins. I've lived in Corbin since 1970. Her husband owned the paper. But as far as the news, we covered some national news too, but most of it was Corbin. That's why she was so shocked. I'm very surprised. When she learned. For a, a parents to disappear and leave three children, just leave them in the bed. There were two faces she just couldn't place. I, I'm gonna keep on asking. I mean, I'm, I've got, got my curiosity up now. I'm Detective Jesse Armstrong with the Kentucky State Police, uh, Post 11 London. Uh, investigating the disappearance of Claude and Sue Shelton. Detectives say the details have been sparse since the start. Just for whatever reason, um, the detective at the time had trouble getting information. They couldn't pin down what happened to the parents. No family, no friends, nobody indicated that they would ever have even think about leaving their kids like that. Not even the basics, like where they went. The investigation never revealed anybody that saw them after that. Uh, couldn't confirm that they actually did or did not go to the truck stop. Uh, the area was searched around their home, around the truck stop. Um, some wooded areas were searched. Um, nothing ever revealed anything. But there were some facts. We found them in the paper. It was 2 a.m. Friday. 2 a.m.? Mm -hmm. Why weren't the kids in bed asleep? The couple left the trailer park in a white two-door Ford. That's the thing is nobody literally ever, ever saw them again. Their children said they were on their way to get coffee and sandwiches at a nearby truck stop. But, you know, that sounds mighty odd to me. I don't know. 
And when they didn't come home, those children called a family friend who called police. It is unusual, and that's, that's one thing that stands out in the case is that all the interviews with all the family, uh, family friends, people that knew Claude and Sue Shelton said that they would never have done this. Never would have left their kids. Never would have left their life. I mean, it seems like they have to show up somewhere. And if they do, detectives say they're ready, holding on to dental records and fingerprints from Claude's time in the Navy and DNA from their daughters that could one day provide a match. And that was entered into a national database um, so that in case a body does come up. After nearly five decades, some believe it's still possible. We're always looking for, for more information. To finish the story. We don't ever put these cases in a drawer and, and never get them back out. And find the couple lost between the lines. LMPD tells us they receive about 2,000 reports of missing people every single year. Most are kids, and only about 5% end up being tragic stories of foul play. But there are some that still don't have answers, including the case of Lisa Green. Some say a picture is worth a thousand words, but for this family, it's a letter. Right on the back of an envelope. A letter they've been leaning on. I think she knew something was gonna happen to her. Handwritten and hidden in her bedroom in the days before she disappeared. And she had wrote that if anything happened to her, this one certain person had said he would try to hurt her. 31-year-old Lisa Green's family believes she had some sort of warning of what was to come. I think that when Lisa walked out of that house, she died that day. It's been more than six years since Leah saw her big sister, Lisa. Hi, I'm Leah Coomer, and I'm looking for my sister, Lisa Green. Cradling a picture from June 2014, showing Leah's now seven-year-old daughter, only a baby at the time, in her missing sister's arms. She'll never get her hugs or her, hey, how you doing? She got robbed of that. That's not fair. Life hasn't stopped for the busy mother of two, now raising a family of her own. But she can't help but look back on better days before her big sister walked out of her home and unknowingly out of her life. She had got up, told my dad that she was just going on the back porch. She didn't have anywhere to go, nothing to do. She was just going to stay at home. Family say it wasn't unusual for Lisa to spend some time on the back porch, especially on an afternoon in June. But this time she left and never came back. They said, I think we had to wait 48 to 72 hours before we could file a missing persons report. So we waited. My dad filed it. That's when LMPD took on the case. One of the first things uh, that happens is we try to establish a, a pattern by persons missing. And what we have to decide is, are they missing or did something sinister happen? Detectives collected DNA samples from Lisa's room. My dad had gave her Lisa's hair out of her hairbrush, a uh, piece of Lisa's clothing, and we'll put this in, name us, run her, we'll see what we can find, nothing. It wasn't only detectives running into roadblocks in the investigation, but also Lisa's family, who had started putting up flyers. Every time we would post them, they would get torn down. It's like someone knew something or they didn't want it to be posted. And there was a certain someone who caught their attention. The person mentioned in Lisa's letter. It was a friend of her and her boyfriend's. But police say while that may have been a person of interest, they would need proof to make him anything more. Sometimes what may be evidence is not evidence, not unless you have something else to corroborate it with. And certainly we would look at that and look at that individual or individuals that may be, but you also have to have a time and a place to put them there. Much like that letter, no lead ever led to Lisa. And we hope that they're safe and sound and just decided that they didn't want to live the life they were living anymore. Unfortunately, sometimes that can end in tragedy. Now, the family prepares for yet another season without her. Like Thanksgiving and Christmas was Lisa's favorite holidays. Facing a reality that's too painful to put into words. As bad as we want her to come home, I don't think she's going to.
Every unsolved case leaves a vacuum of unanswered questions. That is especially true when a child's at the center of the investigation. Now we take you to Hazard, Kentucky, where a six-year-old boy has been missing since 1982. Here's Mystery in the Mountains. On February 12, 1982, in the Pine Tree Hollow area of Knott County, Judy Moore let her six-year-old son, Kelly, go outside and play, and he hasn't been seen since. A mystery deep within the mountains. We searched in here at least three times, I can recall, and there was never no evidence found of the child. Six-year-old Kelly Holland Jr. walked out of his hazard home 36 years ago. Well, I put on his jacket. Hold it up. It had a tear on the bottom of the zipper. And he hugged me and he said, Mom, I love you. At the time, it was nothing unusual. Not until later. When family tried calling Kelly in for dinner, he never came home. Once uh, the trooper had collected uh, initial necessary information, uh, he and the rescue squad uh, searched the area for approximately one hour. And due to uh, manpower issues and a heavy snowfall at that time, the search was initially called off. They searched again the next morning and kept searching in the coming weeks, but the rough terrain never revealed any clues leading to Kelly. It's been a, a long standing unknown. They don't know if the child was taken, ran away, or killed. There's too many ifs, you know what I mean? I mean, there's no answers. At least no answers that police could prove. Early on, officers tried to build a case for Kelly's murder. There was a, a grand jury investigation that was conducted. Suspicions swirling around the family, focusing on a suspect who knew the child well. I'm Judy Moore, and I'm Kelly Holland Jr.'s mom. He was just looking at me. Why am I the only suspect? What did I do wrong? There was never a uh, conclusion as to whether uh, they considered foul play or missing, but uh, I think there were some questions about some issues. I was told by the police that my sister said that I killed him and she helped me bury him. I don't know if that really happened, but that's what I was told. Did you talk to your sister about that? She said it didn't happen, but... but you don't know? She, after a while, she quit talking to me. Police were never able to get the indictment. Weeks without answers turned into months, months into years, Kelly's face changing and his memory fading. Many who were involved, who lived in the area or who were family or friends have, have passed on. Kelly's case sat stagnant until five years ago. Investigators received information of a possible grave at a uh, residence or the what was left of a residence on Pine Tree Hollow. A tip leading them back to that secluded street. Several troopers and detectives came to this location, uh, found what uh, they believed was being described as that place of, of the, the grave. But unfortunately, through several hours or days worth of digging and, and excavating, they were unable to locate any any type of um, remains or any clue or instance that there was ever anyone buried there. Another dead end clue, leading detectives to believe they may never find Kelly. I would imagine that there's probably no chance of, you know, through just decomposition and, and animals, wildlife and so forth, that, uh, uh, that that would make it probably nearly impossible. But there is one person who holds out hope. Kelly, I love you so much. 
Just let me know. She thinks Kelly could be watching. Say hi, Mom. That's all I'd ask. I wouldn't want nothing else from her. And she has a message to others who might be thinking something else. Anybody that thinks I killed my son, may God have mercy on them. How would you feel if it was your child? Our unsolved team has crisscrossed the state to dig deeper into Kentucky's cold cases, but this one kept us close to home. It started in 2001 and took a turn in 2003. We call this investigation the runaway. Time can be a mysterious thing. Sometimes it's kind. There's always a possibility that somebody knows more than what they're saying. Sometimes it's cruel. Most people don't realize how quickly a body can become skeletonized. It wasn't Jessica Wallace's time. And 17 years after her death, her final moments remain a mystery. It was 2001. 17 year old, blondish brown hair, habitual runaway. Jessica Wallace was reported missing. Kind of been in and out of uh, foster care, state care. The teen had been living at Home of the Innocents. From the information, People that are around her she occasionally use drugs, uh, alcohol. But she was last seen in Taylor County when a friend dropped her off outside a mobile home. The person there that lives at that mobile home um, tells her she can't stay there. Um, uh, she gave, gave me a statement as far as what she had on, had a little backpack with her, that sort of thing. And then uh, she goes back out walking on the road. Walking down this rural Taylor County road, it would be the last time the teen was ever seen alive. As time went on, I think there were some rumors that started circulating that maybe she took off to Florida or something. People just kind of stopped looking for her. Two years passed with no sign of Jessica. And then one day a man was looking for something else. There's a guy that's uh, out in the woods just looking for Indian rocks, that sort of thing, and comes across the skeletal remains. The discovery only a few miles from where the teen was last seen, but matching the scattered bones to the body of a 17-year-old wouldn't be simple. So police called an expert. I was the state forensic anthropologist. Dr. Emily Craig. I do remember there were scattered skeletal remains and there were about two years worth of leaf fall. So we actually had to excavate down through the leaves and the soil, a couple inches of soil to get to the remains. Craig, in these never before released crime scene photos, dug through the leaves. When I worked the scene, I had one rule, and that was if you see bone, leave it alone. She and a dozen others walked the woods. You don't need all the remains, you just need the right ones. Every bone we picked up confirmed that it was a, a teenager. And some of the other bones we picked up confirmed it was female. Some of the other bones we picked up confirmed she was white. So all of a sudden, we have a biological profile. A biological profile that pointed to Jessica Wallace. I am so often surprised that the family is relieved, so at least they know. It's not the news they want, but it's, it's the end. It's some resolution. But in Jessica's case, this would only be part of the answer. How she died hidden in the time that had passed. You take someone that doesn't have a set pattern, that kind of bounces around from place to place, so when they, when, when they come in, you know, when you get those type complaints as, as a missing person, uh, 
generally, you know, the investigation starts under the premise that they're probably going to show back up because they have a history of doing that. And so then you're so far behind if they don't show back up and by the time a body's found or whatever, you're, you know, a lot of times the, any evidence you might have gained is already gone or decomposed or whatever. And so you're, you're already way behind. Time took its toll on the investigation, but detectives collected what they could. There was a couple of very small pieces of duct tape uh, that were located in close proximity to the body. They sent the duct tape and a few other items to the lab to be tested, but the results were inconclusive. As time moves on, the case stands still. So it's almost going to have to go back to either somebody saw something or know something more about the case and what they've told or they knew something that they or seen something that they thought was in, insignificant at the time but uh, may actually uh, be significant. This not knowing just tears families apart. A young mother missing and then discovered dead. Like all of the cases our unsolved team covers, this case has questions. But unlike most of our cases, police say they have answers. So why is the case still open? This story takes us to Dunville, Kentucky to tell Whitney Copley's story. Six feet below ground in a child-sized coffin, all that's left of Whitney Copley. My gut feeling from day one was she was dead. Three of her sisters sit around the kitchen island describing what they call terrible time. <laughs> We've not had the best past. A past riddled with heartache, divorce, depression, and eventually murder. Whitney's dad convicted of killing her mom. Whitney just after that started down a bad road. She got into drugs, alcohol, and you know, we really didn't know all this until later. And uh, I mean, I tried everything, sent her to rehabs, we, you know, did everything we could. The sisters aren't secretive about Whitney's troubled past. Becoming a young mother, they wanted her to be healthy. They wanted her to get help. And then September 2015, all they wanted was to find her. She left on Monday after I begged her not to go, um, knowing that, you know, something could happen or might happen because with her history that we, you know, had from her being gone. Six days later, the sisters were certain something was wrong. We pinpointed that she had left the party with these three, these two guys and her, and they were headed back toward Dunville, and she was supposedly on her way home when the truck broke down. The truck stopped right in front of a gas station. Police found surveillance video confirming the story. And then it shows that she walks to the back of the parking lot close to the post office, and then that's the last time she's seen but then the boys come back. Searches of surrounding areas started immediately. Numerous people showed up at night. I know there were several, several state police, you know, there was county, might have been even a couple of city cops out there as well as volunteer people. But days turned into weeks, weeks into months. November 2016, the first sign of the missing mother. I remember we were searching a creek bank and one of the cops or somebody yelled, we think we found something. It was Whitney's remains buried below leaves on a hill behind the gas station where she was last seen alive. I'm kind of shocking, you know, that she was a fan right there. At her family's request, her bones, few enough to fit into a small box, were sent to a forensic expert. But the findings didn't reveal anything about what had happened to her. There wasn't a whole lot of feedback from the police. They, you know, to them, she was found, it was undecided, they were finished. It shows at this time that there's no foul play suspected. Right now, it's, it's looking as possible for most likely an accidental overdose. The family says they went years without hearing from police. Under the impression the case was closed, they asked for Whitney's personal items discovered during the investigation. We just wanted to know, you know, what she had and asked for, you know, the records just so we could see all of that. And uh, so we sent an open records request, uh, called numerous times trying to get answers about that. Frankfurt, I called Frankfurt a lot. So then, um, so then I filed an open records request through uh, the office in Frankfurt. Right before Christmas this year, she gets a letter back from Frankfurt that said, uh, 
After researching this case, we have found that the case is not closed. News that the case was open came after the unsolved team called police asking for the same records. We received a similar letter denying our request. And then we asked why. But there's still a piece of evidence at the lab that's being examined. Just sitting at the lab? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, they're backed up. But according to the forensic crime lab director, the lab has actually been waiting on Kentucky State Police. An evidence log revealing the lab received DNA from the scene in 2017, but didn't receive a sample to compare it to until late last month. I feel like it's after you started contacting them is when all this started happening again. Police say new evidence could come from the test, and that could bring new answers. They couldn't explain why it's taken this family so long to get theirs. So the family told us that the first phone call they received was just a few weeks ago after we called them. Why do you think that is? I don't know anything about that. I said I, I didn't work the case personally. It's the response this family has grown accustomed to. So the sisters say they will continue to wait. And it shouldn't have to be like that. You know, you're already going through so much. Why do you have to fight to get help, you know, or to get justice? Now this case is so huge, investigators told us they had multiple filing cabinets filled with records and documents. But here's a quick look at some of the pieces of this case that really stand out. Fireman's Prayer, when I'm called to duty, God, whenever flames may rage, give me strength to save someone's life, whatever be its age. It's still hard, you know. Enable me to be alert and hear the weakest shout. Sorry, uh, but it, I still don't know what to say. And quickly and efficiently put the fire out. Inside the Highview Fire Department, you'll find a brotherhood. <laughs> For Craig Jury, it was a family affair. We grew up here. We were here all of the time. His dad, a longtime chief, Craig followed in his footsteps. I never really got exactly what happened from my father. He couldn't talk about it. Um, it just tore him up. August 24th, 1994. They were in my dad's fire car when the call came. Craig and his dad respond to a fire in southeast Louisville. To me, it ranks with a fire I never want to see again. Craig and others were inside when a flashover engulfed the home. As soon as we pulled up is when the, um, I want to say the house exploded into flames. So my heart sank because I knew, knew there's fire primers inside. There had to be. Uh, there wouldn't be a hose going in the door if there wasn't firefighters in there. Craig and another were trapped inside. But when the helicopter landed, I knew it was bad. Rescued from the flames, Craig was seriously hurt. When I got over to him that night, he, he was just a pink-faced kid. There was no freckles. Friends and family rushing to meet him at the burn unit, while his brothers continued to battle the blaze. I was just getting madder and madder and madder. The fire wasn't going out. first we thought this is going well you know um, he's gonna recover 12 days passed in the ICU I think he thought he was gonna get better too the sad part about firefighters or emergency responders funerals is uh, they're beautiful we gather and we wonder 
what happened a couple of weeks ago. We're confused, and we're saddened, and we're angered, and we wonder why. My name is Larry Four. I'm a retired detective from the old Jefferson County Police Department arson unit. And I was the original inve lead investigator assigned to the fire which involved the death of Highview firefighter Craig Gurry. On the scene all night, he started collecting clues. Sources of ignition. In search of something evidence of accelerants that would change everything. Everybody involved in examining the scene felt like it was a case of arson. That was a dark, dark period. Knowing the fire that killed Craig was no accident made finding answers that much more important. Do I want to see somebody brought to justice? Absolutely. I, I'm not vengeful for it. Somebody needs to pay for for a life that was taken. Detectives looked deep into the details. The investigation was so extensive, it led to other counties outside Jefferson County. The case was presented to a grand jury. The Commonwealth attorney at the time had it presented uh, as an investigative grand jury. Attempting to indict multiple people for the fire, the grand jury said no. It's probably one of the more frustrating crimes to investigate because first you have to prove that it was arson, that it was an intentionally set fire. That proof has to be something that will hold up in a court proceeding. And then secondly, you have to do what in, happens in all other crime investigations. You have to find the people responsible and prove they did it. And 25 years later, it's a case they're still working to close. It can't possibly be 25 years because I remember so well, uh, you know, his goofiness and his his antics and you know how he how he would tease, you know. So it it doesn't seem like it's been that long ago. And it hurts 25 years later. I'm not a 24 year old kid anymore. He was just family. I want to feel my calling and to give the best in me, to guard my every neighbor and protect his property. And if according to my fate, I am to lose my life, bless with your protecting hands, my children and my wife. Families say Savannah Crawford was different from other kids. She spent a lot of time walking around her hometown of Litchfield, Kentucky. She liked to be alone, but it was one of those walks she treasured that ended up being the beginning of the end. If Savannah Crawford's case was a movie. This is the door that she had come out of and she had walked up the sidewalk and they had caught her on surveillance walking off of the sidewalk and that was the last time that she was seen. It would be a thriller. Uh, during that time, we received hundreds of leads, uh, hundreds of people who said that they had seen her from as far away as other states. A child missing from a small Kentucky town, a search full of suspense. We worked so hard, we did everything that we knew to do. We asked for outside help. I feel like I did everything I could to find this child. The mystery taking a terrible turn. She said, Ashley, she said, they found Savannah, and she's dead. I'm Detective Kevin Smith with the Litchfield Police Department, and I'm currently the lead investigator on the missing person case involving Savannah Crawford. 16-year-old Savannah Crawford was known to wander the streets of her community. This child, uh, every day she would come home from school, she would, uh, check in with her mother, and then she would go out and walk. And this child covered several miles a day. Uh, she would walk around, listen to her music. But she always came home until one night in April 2017. Uh, whenever the child didn't come home as she normally would, the mother became concerned and had been out looking for the child. So then she had contacted 
law enforcement in order to report that she was missing. The night shift officer at Litchfield Police searched for the missing teen. Most of the time, you know, they'll, we can usually find them by the time this shift, you know, is over. This was a little bit different. Night turned to morning. Savannah was nowhere to be found. We're crossing every T and dotting every I and unturning every stone that we could think of. Missing posters went up in store windows. Local law enforcement called in federal help. As days turned to weeks, families started to lose hope of a happy ending. We kind of felt like, are we even going to ever find her? Is she going to be alive when we find her? Seasons changed in Kentucky from spring to summer, and so did habits. And on a warm evening in June, a father-son fishing trip led them to a bridge in Hardin County, 18 miles from where Savannah was last seen alive. That's who initiated the 911 call. Hardin County Deputy Coroner Shana Norton was one of the first to respond to the scene. She's found down in this, you know, a river creek bed with no nothing else around. So, of course, we automatically think, is it a homicide? You know, did she fall? Was she thrown off? you know, the side of the bridge, or, um, you know, at this point, it's anything that we can think of. Her team took note of everything. She was skeletonized, um, completely skeletonized. Um, all of her clothing was still on, um, pants, shoes, socks, shirt, jacket. Um, we did even find uh, some money that was beside the body. That money, the one and only clue collected as possible evidence in the case. No cell phone, no wallet, bag, backpack, anything like that. Investigators were able to positively identify her using dental records. We know who she is and we know that she's deceased, but we don't know when she died or how she died. They were hopeful further examination of her bones would bring more answers as to what happened in the three months she was missing. There was nothing. No bullet holes, no fractures, no nothing. Nothing. No evidence of foul play in the autopsy. No traces of anything in toxicology. For investigators, it was the only thing worse than delivering news of her death. Some people will say, well, they had closure, they found her. No, they didn't have closure. They still lost their baby. They've lost their daughter, their sister, their granddaughter, and they don't have an answer as, as to how or why. Despite the roadblocks, this detective promises to never stop searching for Savannah's story. Somebody knows. Somebody knows how she got from Litchfield, Kentucky to where she was located in Hardin County. Her family says they're desperate to fill in the blanks. And I just feel like everybody's just giving up. <laughs> but I don't want to give up. But this team of investigators says they won't give up. This is not a case that you put in a drawer and forget about. It's not going to happen. Going so far as to remind us, the final document in Savannah's life is one they're willing to adjust. A death certificate can always be changed. Our unsolved cases sometimes end in unexpected ways. After we aired an unsolved about Kamaria Johnson in 2022, she was found and reunited with her family. After almost a year of searching, and the only piece of evidence was security footage from a gas station. Kamaria had left home after an argument with her father and never came back, even after he went searching for her. A man had admitted to picking her up on the highway just miles from her home in Hardin County and then dropping her off at a Meade County gas station. That was the last piece of surveillance video that showed her alive. Luckily, her family said she is safe tonight and police say there are no criminal charges at this time. And now take a look at this. This is Linda Bennett, a mother, grandmother, sister and daughter from Columbus, Ohio. I first covered her case five years ago when she was only known as Jane Doe. I saw the evidence, the crime scenes and the leads. I also talked to the woman who found her body. Now, Kentucky State Police say they know her name and her family using DNA technology to finally break the case. At the table with a Kentucky State Police detective, crime scene photos show us exactly what the witnesses saw. It was May of 1988 in Corinth, Kentucky, a woman's body abandoned on the side of a rural road. We talked to the woman who found her. The thing I remember most, and I mentioned to the detective, 
wearing nothing but men's socks and they were pulled up perfectly, uh, brown socks, just perfectly done. Joy Kelly and her husband found Jane Doe and reported the body to police. Even three decades later, she said the details of the disturbing discovery are cemented in her memory. Everything, everything about it. I remember, I, and I know what I was wearing. I know what my husband was wearing. I know what my plans were for that day. And um, you don't, you don't forget it. She didn't forget it and neither did Kentucky State Police. Working the case rigorously for years, Detective Andre Samu showed us the key DNA evidence back in 2018. It was this, her hair, collected by the coroner at the crime scene 30 years earlier and preserved. So the coroner picked up the hair samples and put it in an envelope and saved it. This is before DNA came along. It would be that DNA sample that eventually led to a break in the case. New information leading detectives to the woman's son who submitted his DNA and it was a match. Jane Doe was identified as Linda Bennett, seen here in school photos from her childhood. Her family reported her missing to police in Ohio the same year she was found dead in Kentucky. But communication between police departments wasn't what it is today. And the missing woman was never linked to the unidentified body found 160 miles away. All it takes is maybe one little piece and it's finding that one little piece that might resolve this thing. Fast forward 30 plus years, investigative efforts are ongoing. Detectives working to turn this major breakthrough into a case closed. And if you're interested, you can find more unsolved cases on whas11.com. I'm Shay McAllister. Thanks for watching.